are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Good evening, 12s. This is your host, Corbin Smith, joined as always on Blue Friday by my co-host, Nick Lee. Glad to have Nick back in the saddle. And before we even talk football, got to congratulate you. Got a new little guy in the household, now two children. So uh, I'm just stunned that you have the time to you know, do a one-hour podcast with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually nice, nice to get back to some normalcy. And uh, even though I've gone nocturnal, uh it's uh it's a pleasure to be back talking football it's i always have energy for that yeah again i know you said you had to take a nice little nap before this show it's a it's new territory when you go from one kid to having two and Game you're time. quickly learning that but congratulations again on outstanding news for the locked on seahawks family here we're gonna get to some football here we're gonna be talking this upcoming matchup seahawks 49ers rematch at lumen field Seahawks are reeling. They've lost three straight. The 49ers going the opposite direction. They've won three straight games and now are in the sixth spot, the number two wild card spot in the NFC. So we're going to be looking at keys to victory, how Seattle can get back into the win column, and of course, our weekly picks to click. So let's get to it. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Now for your lead story here on Locked On Seahawks. For a second straight week, Seattle will be out one of its cornerstones on the offensive line guard, Damian Lewis, has been listed as doubtful for Sunday's game. But if you were listening to Pete Carroll during his Friday press conference, it sounds like he's already been ruled out. and He's got a litany of injuries he's dealing with, still battling a shoulder problem that cost him week seven against the Saints. He's got a hyperextended elbow. And oh, by the way, he had a cyst removed from his groin as well. So as Carroll said, he's really banged up. Doesn't sound like there's any way he's going to be playing on Sunday against the 49ers. And so that's a big loss in the middle of that offensive line, particularly for the run game. They really missed his ability to drive blockers or drive defenders off the line of scrimmage last week against Washington. And they're going to be missing him again. So likely that means second straight start for Kyle Fuller at left guard. Maybe we see some Phil Haynes this week. I was calling for Phil Haynes to be the starter last Monday. That didn't happen. He didn't play any snaps, but maybe that changes up because Fuller really struggled at left guard. You can hide some of his deficiencies at center, but left guard, it's much tougher to do that, and we saw that on Monday night. Yeah, and for the second straight week, they don't really get a break as far as the defensive line they face. <laughs> when you got, you know, the Samson uh, Abukum and Nick Bosa, Arik, Arms, Arik Armstead, and, and DJ Jones over there, now that's that's not exactly a, a defensive line where you want to be starting backup interior linemen. <laughs> And the, you know, the opposing coaching staff knows that. And they're going to be foaming at the mouth, scheming to take advantage of this, exposing Kyle Fuller if they can. And Phil, yeah, I mean, if, if it gets so bad, why not play Phil Haynes? What do you literally have to lose? So ho hopefully Kyle Fuller can bounce back. But that is a really concerning uh, development with, with Damian Lewis. Best, best wishes to him because this is a game also – where you might be able to run the ball a little bit if you have some healthy horses in the stable, but the running backs can make, I just watched a World War II movie last night when I was up with the babe, uh, Forgotten Battle on Netflix, and it, they, they can make their own infirmary with running backs. <laughs> That's, it's, it's, it's a pretty sad, um, and hence why they brought in, you know, a former All-Pro. Yeah, Adrian yeah. Peterson coming in, and that move was made because they've had so many injuries at running back. It feels like this is an issue year in, year out for the Seahawks, but they have three running backs listed as questionable for Sunday's game. We know Chris Carson's out for the season, still has not underwent neck surgery, but Alex Collins, Rashad Penny, and Travis Homer all listed as questionable. They did get some good news the end of this week on Homer and Penny. They were both full participants in Friday's practice, so that tells me – barring a setback that those two are going to be available Now, how long they can keep those two on the field, especially Rashad Penny, who knows with his injury luck during his time in Seattle. But it looks like it's pretty optimistic that those two will be available. Alex Collins up to this point has been able to play through a groin and abdomen injury. He has started seven straight games. I, I almost wonder, I expect he's going to play, but I almost wonder if this is a case if the other two backs are available and they can bring Adrian Peterson up. They might just decide, you know what, we're going to give Alex Collins a week 
so that he has an opportunity to maybe get over this groin issue that he's just kind of been nursing and playing through. It's possible they could choose to do that, but I don't know if they'll have that kind of flexibility. Pete Carroll was not committing to which running backs were going to be available for this game. So those three, who knows which combination of those players is going to be dressing against the 49ers. And maybe Adrian Peterson and or Josh Johnson will be up on the active roster as well, come off the practice squad. Uh, they definitely are dealing with a situation of attrition in the backfield as they have been for several weeks in a row. I guess the good news though, Nick, they don't really have any other injuries. Those are the only four players that were even listed on the final injury report. Now, DK Metcalf's been limited a few practices as he's been all year with a foot injury, but he wasn't listed. He's going to be playing. Gabe Jackson was limited with a knee issue, wasn't on the final injury report, so he's going to play. They're, they're pretty healthy aside from the backfield being banged up and missing Damian Lewis. The 49ers, you can't say the same for them. They've got two of their best players likely to be out for this game. One of them, Debo Samuel, already ruled out, and that's a huge loss for San Francisco. Yeah, because you know the type of problems that he can pose to any defense, much less one uh, that uh, can be uh, – they've been better, but you know they, they can be prone to the big explosive play every now and then too in the Seahawks, and you saw that the last time these two teams played, though, I would say – that this defense is an extremely much, um, uh, improved unit since the last time these two teams met, even if the Seahawks won that game. So I'd definitely say that it's advantage Seahawks to have to not see Debo Samuel in there. Cause you saw even just last week, the last couple of weeks, he's just, he's been, especially since they've been banged up and running back and other, and other places, he's been their, their spark plug. They're, they're Darren Sproles. They're, you know, the, 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 the spoon that stirs the hot cocoa, you know, it's, it's a, he's been their guy. So having them not there, you know, that's that's a big it, it's a big advantage for the Seahawks. And uh, boy, if you would have told me uh, even just a few weeks ago or, you know, maybe after week one, when the if things are looking good after beating the Colts, that the Seahawks would be relying on possibly Adrian Peterson or the, the shell of Adrian Peterson and maybe Josh Johnson at running back that <laughs> I would have I would have had several questions and, and I still do. Um, but yeah, advantage Seahawks, certainly from a health standpoint. Yeah, Fred Warner being out potentially on defense, too. Your BYU boy. <laughs> uh, him Damn, being listed as doubtful right. with a hamstring injury. That is another one that could be big, especially because this team has not been able to run the ball. If you don't have Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw has already been ruled out, they're going to be very shorthanded at linebackers. So if they can get past the first level, that's a big if. Th the matchups between the running backs and linebackers you would think would favor Seattle – but it all depends on which running back is going to be available. So some big question marks there. We'll see which players actually suit up on Sunday, which players get elevated from the practice squad. We have no idea what that combination of running backs is going to look like other than we know DJ Dallas is going to play and he will get his snaps. But aside from that, we don't know which other players are going to be out there, how the snaps are going to be divvied up going into this game. It's going to be a game time decision to see which players are available and who's going to get a chance to tote the rock. And the Seahawks are hoping they can get more than 10 carries for their running backs this week, unlike last Monday. Let's talk keys to victory. But before we get to that point here, I want to tell you guys about Boost Mobile. You listen to podcasts for the power of knowledge. You switch to Boost Mobile for the power of saving money. Because with Boost, you will get the power of a free 5G phone. So you can listen to all the latest episodes, whether it's Locked On Seahawks or any of your other favorite podcasts. The power of three unlimited data lines for $30 a month so your family can harness all that brain power too. And the power of one of America's largest 5G networks so you can do it all at the speed of 5G. With all that money you'll save and all that knowledge you'll gain, just how powerful will you become? Switch to Boost Mobile and find out. Get a free Samsung Galaxy A32 5G when you switch to one of America's largest 5G networks. More power to save. That's Boost Mobile. And this holiday season, grab the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar or even better than a candy bar, the Built Bar. It's filled with so much holiday goodness, rich with decadent flavor, covered in chocolate, but amazingly low in calories, sugar, net carbs, and fat, and high in protein. You get to boast of the best of both worlds, delicious and healthy. So many flavors, you'll have a hard time choosing, trust me. Whether it's raspberry, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, cookies and cream, so many delicious flavors. I have a hard time deciding which one I want before I work out. Built Bar gives you that extra fuel you need to bust down those mall doors and battle the holiday shoppers. Or if you're just standing in endless shopping lines, Built Bar can give you that extra something to keep you going. 
So throw one in your jacket or purse. You never know when you're going to need it because it's the season of peace and love. Don't forget to bring your favorite Built Bar flavor to family parties. People are so passionate about their favorite flavor, they'll fight for it, and things could get out of hand. Want to cozy up with something warm? Here's a holiday secret. Dip your favorite Built Bar into a piping hot cup of cocoa. Let it melt a little and give your beverage a bit of that Built Bar flavor. Plus, you'll have a nice melty Built Bar to go with it. Be sure to have a couple napkins on hand. Trust me, I learned that lesson the hard way. Go to Built.com and use the promo code LOCK15, and you will get 15% off your order. All right, Nick, let's talk keys to victory, something the Seahawks have been allergic to for the last close to two months. They've lost six of their past seven games. They did beat the 49ers back in week four in Santa Clara. They were two and two at the time, so there was still a lot of hope, which mostly has dried up now at this point. But this has been one team that the Seahawks, knock on wood, have had persistent success against that has even carried over into this season. They have dominated this rivalry series for close to a decade they get a chance to continue that dominance against a 49ers team that's going to be missing some key pieces in Debo Samuel, most likely Fred Warner, Dre Greenlaw being out. Still a very well-coached team that's been red hot winning their last three games. So we'll start on offense for the Seahawks. What do you think the Seahawks need to do offensively to sweep the season series against their bitter rivals, their bitter rivals from the Bay Area? Well, I think this is something that Seahawks Twitter especially – has been clamoring for, and that's just the aggressiveness. There's um, it's just uh, lethargic is, is a word I'd use to, to describe the offense, much like what Oregon's doing right now against Utah. Um, it, it's kind of that's kind of what the offense has looked like. Just, just I don't know if it's like I, I don't want to say lack of desire, but there's just no explosiveness, no aggressiveness, and it's it, it's contagious. That that stuff kind of breaks down the rest of the offense. So I think the first and foremost, you got to be more aggressive on 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 your play calling and on your on your play action, because we all know Russell Wilson is the best play action quarterback in the NFL. That's that's just that's just what's what it is. Now you need to get him in a position to to, to take advantage of that. So um, it, it's 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 going to be tough with a, a decent pass defense in the 49ers, but they also are 27th in yards per play allowed, which suggests that they do you know allow some explosive plays every now and then, and those can come with a solid run uh, pass or uh, play action, excuse me, newborn brain. Um, and also there's two sides of that coin with play action. You got to be aggressive. You got to, you got to, to call it, you also got to be effective in the run game. And if you don't, if you're not effective in the run game, that play action is going to dry up real quick. Yeah. There's some data out there that suggests you don't need a run game to be able to run play action. I think there's a little credence to that, but as a former player, I remember how much easier it was to, you know, forget about those play fakes when you're playing a team that disregard run the football yeah. against you. It really does have an impact when you're on the field. And so it would be nice to see the Seahawks against a 49ers team that's near the bottom of the league in yards after contact allowed for runners. It'd be nice to see, see them have some of that physicality carry over the run game. Cause last week we saw absolutely none of that starting with the offensive line. Everything's fallen on that group up front. Again, no Damian Lewis, that is going to make running the football a lot tougher for Seattle, especially if Kyle Fuller's his replacement. He just doesn't have the ability to knock defenders off the line of scrimmage. More times than not, he's the one that's getting knocked backward. It's been a struggle for him in the run game. When he was playing center, he had the same issues. He, he's just not a physical run blocker that's going to be able to hold his own in terms of strength and going up against big defensive linemen. He has issues with moving them. He can win as a zone blocker occasionally, but that leads me to my point. If you're going to run the football and they've got to be able to, I think you're going to have to lean heavily on running to the right side behind Gabe Jackson and Brandon Shell. And Brandon Shell has not necessarily been a dominant run blocker, but you weren't having any success anytime you tried to run to the left side. And I expect Eric Armstead is going to be playing a lot across from Kyle Fuller because – 49ers aren't stupid. They're going to see what Jonathan Allen did on Monday night working against Fuller, and they're going to try to do the same thing, putting their best defensive tackle up against him. So I anticipate we're going to see a lot of that in this game. I think if Seattle wants to be able to run the ball, they're going to have to do it to the right side, and that's where they had success in week four, too. Their big touchdown run from Alex Collins was to the right side, and they had a few other big runs that they broke in the second half that came on that side of the line of scrimmage. And so I think that's where you can really get things moving and maybe running some to the perimeter too, especially with the linebackers being banged up and being down to second and third stringers. 
you know, maybe that's where a healthy Rashad Penny can still make a difference. If he can just stay on the field, those perimeter runs might be something that you can do against this 49ers defense as well. But they're going to have to find a way to have more balance than they did last week. It really put their passing game in a difficult spot. If they can't run the ball, this is going to be a defense that's going to be tough to move the ball against at this point. Yeah, DJ Jones is actually second in the NFL in uh, run stop win rate. So he, he's definitely a force to be reckoned with, and you got to account for him wherever you're running the ball for sure. And scheme, if you want to run at him, you got to scheme to give him it, that one on one stuff ain't going to work against DJ Jones for sure. And another thing you mentioned with some, some of the second and third string linebackers that the Niners are going to be throwing out there. Sorry, my man, Fred Warner, but uh, this one this one's personal. <laughs> um, it, it's. This is an opportunity, I think, to create some mismatches with guys like Will Disley, the tight ends, and, and getting, getting the ball out quickly because we know that that pass rush for the 49ers is pretty fierce. And the, the easiest, the two easiest things to do to alleviate a pass rush is to run the ball effectively and get the ball out quick in the pass game with some slants, some screens, some, you know, and, and just kind of get them back on their heels a little bit. And that's easier said than done. And really the Seahawks just, have just not done that simply this year. So I'm hoping that they're scheming for that and getting the ball out quickly and getting the ball, you know, over the heads of those those backup linebackers, putting them in tough spots, you know, those levels concepts where you know, the, these young and inexperienced linebackers have to make split decisions, which could lead to explosive plays if you put them in the wrong spot or the right spot if you're the Seahawks offense. So that, that's another thing is you, you got to get you got to put your players in a position to succeed and also put their players in a position to make some tough decisions that could cost them. And I think with the linebackers that are out there you can get the running backs more involved in the passing game too. That has been something that I have not seen Shane Waldron really try to do too much. And unfortunately, the best play they had on Monday going to a running back, Alex Collins fumbled the ball. So it's unfortunate because that was a really nice little dump off from Russell Wilson, and you'd like to see him do that more often. So get those running backs involved and really stress those linebackers out because you're going to have some inexperienced players that are out there. And so that could be a huge advantage for Seattle on offense. Now, when they're on the defensive side of the football, the nice thing is you don't have to worry about Debo Samuel, but they've still got plenty of weapons. The one that I think the Seahawks can't let take over this game, and I actually would still say this if Debo Samuel was in there. I still think George Kittle scares me as much as any tight end in the NFL. So that matchup falls in Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs mainly, your safeties, because you know George Kittle's going to get some chances to get the ball downfield. He's going to work the middle of the field as well. Linebackers are going to get stressed some by him. But you can't let him dominate the game. And there have been times in the past where he has done that to the Seahawks. They had some success against him back in week four. He wasn't healthy in that game, though. He was a questionable designation for the game and kind of a game-time decision. He's healthier this time around. Had only one catch last week. That might not be a good omen going into this game because – you and I both know that George Kittle can do a lot of damage. They're going to have to find a way to be physical with him off the line of scrimmage. They're going to have to be physical at the catch point like they were the last time around. Otherwise, he's a player that can really dominate your secondary and your linebackers, and he can create big plays. Real problem in the red zone as well. To me, he is going to be that security blanket for Jimmy Garoppolo now that Debo Samuel is out for this game. So that is priority one, two, and three for me in the passing game. You've got to figure out where George Kittle is. Get a second defender around him and don't let him beat you. Yeah, you mentioned the red zone. And this is the one, one thing the Seahawks have done really well on defense is, is limiting touchdowns allowed in the red zone. And they're actually fourth in the NFL in, D, in touchdowns allowed on red zone trips. And funny enough, the 49ers are first in the NFL in turning red zone trips into touchdowns. <laughs> so this will be a kind of a best on best scenario there. And I think George Kittle is, is certainly – uh, one of the biggest factors in that. And another thing is, yeah, get, get in Jimmy G's head and disguise coverages, confuse him. Because I, I say this every time the Seahawks play the 49ers, I do not have a super high opinion of Jimmy G. I think he's a fine quarterback. I think he's a guy, if you got pieces around him, can really succeed. I mean, you saw them run the Super Bowl appearance with that kind of stuff. Um, I just don't think he's that type of quarterback that raises your whole franchise and, and takes a team on his back. And, and can will a team to victory like other quarterbacks in the league, like what we've seen Russell Wilson do, Brady, you know, Mahomes. We haven't – he just doesn't have – I mean, that's not quite fair since those are three of the better in, uh, quarterbacks in the league. But I, I think he's in that, you know, right in that average area where he has pieces, he gets a rhythm, he's trouble. But if you get in his head, you rattle him, he can be very terrible. So that, that's kind of where this game could tip is how comfortable are you letting Jimmy G get? Yeah, you yeah. want to let – you want to let him beat you, though. 
you still want Jimmy Garoppolo to be the one that's going to win the game. And, and the thing that's really changed for this 49ers offense the last three games, they've scored 31-plus points per game on average during this win streak. They put up 31 on the Rams. They had 30-plus points on the Jaguars. And then last week they scored 34 points against the Minnesota Vikings. So they have been scoring a lot of points. And they've gotten back to their bread and butter. And to me, obviously stopping George Kittle is going to be crucial in the passing game. But maybe priority number one above everything else, the Seahawks have to be fundamentally sound in terms of their gap integrity against the run game. That was something that, going back and looking at the film from Monday, the Washington football team had to really work to get their 100-plus rushing yards in that game. Had 43 rushing attempts because they had the ball so much. And they were able to really wear down Seattle's front. But there were a lot of gap-related issues that Washington was not able to take advantage of. And you know Kyle Shanahan's watching that on tape and saying, okay, I'm going to get some of that pre-snap motion. I'm going to create extra gaps. And I'm going to get this defense put in a bad spot. I'm going to get them put in a bind. There's going to be creases opened up. And I'm going to get my rookie running back, Elijah Mitchell, going. They're averaging 178 rushing yards per game the last three weeks. So this is an offense that's kind of found its identity again. They're back to grounding and pounding. They'll run their play action off it. They'll mix in some screens. And occasionally they'll have an explosive play downfield when they are able to complement Jimmy Garoppolo and take some of that heat off of him. So you get it yourself in a position. The 49ers did not run the ball very well in week four when these two teams played. Get yourself in that spot where the quarterback and the receivers have to beat you, especially without Debo Samuel being healthy. Find a way to lock down that run game. And the biggest key when you're playing an offense coordinated by Kyle Shanahan is gap discipline, staying sound with your run fits because he will catch you and he will capitalize if you are not. And so that, to me, has got to be priority number one above all else. And then, of course, George Kittle slowing him down in the passing game. If you can do those two things and you force Jimmy Garoppolo to beat you with the receivers having the outside, Brandon Ayuk's a fine player. But I would like my chances then if you have stopped the run game and they're not dominating at the line of scrimmage and you're preventing George Kittle from getting a bunch of big plays. I would like Seattle's chances of winning this football game if they can check off those two boxes. Yeah, because, you know, Kyle Shanahan is going to make you keep, you know, keep you honest with that gap integrity. And I think if we do those two, if the Seahawks do those few things that we're going to, the Seahawks are going to find themselves in a one score game in the fourth quarter. And really that's all you want. That's especially in a tough season like this, you want a chance to win. Now the Seahawks kind of almost had that situation last Monday when they were so ineffective so late yet, they still had the ball with a chance to at least send it into overtime and fail just a two point conversion short. But all you can ask for is to, to keep this game close and have a chance in the fourth quarter. I think the Seahawks absolutely can do that. They do kind of have that mental edge against the 49ers. I know maybe my, my, the confidence might be winning in the team, but I think that's another thing to keep in mind is the Seahawks have had success even when they've been playing poorly against the Niners, and the Niners know that. Our both teams know that. So maybe there's this uh, unfounded confidence that the Seahawks can find this week. Before we get to our picks to click, make sure to check out Bet Online. They've got you covered all season long for more props, odds, and lines than ever before. As football season continues to march to the playoffs, Bet Online remains your top spot for all the sports action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code LOCKED ON to receive your bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. So we're less than 48 hours away from kickoff at Lumen Field. The Seahawks trying to keep their very slim playoff hopes alive. I will say this, they are up to 2% now. That's their odds for making the postseason. It was 1%, less than 1% yesterday. When I asked Pete Carroll about it on Wednesday, he was like, you can have less than 1%. Well, now we don't have to worry about that particular question, at least for this week. They are up to 2%. So double down. The Seahawks are back in the hunt at 3-8. and eight, But they need that fourth win this week against the 49ers to keep those very slim playoff hopes alive. Let's talk picks to click. Who needs to have a big game here? Or who we expect to have a big game for the Seahawks against the 49ers? Start on the offensive side of the football, Nick. Who is your pick to click in week 13? Well, like we mentioned, the 49ers are struggling to keep their linebackers healthy. And I think that's uh, 
that that can be indicative or that can lead to some success in the run game, that, that there could be opportunities for the Seahawks to take advantage of that. Unfortunately, the Seahawks themselves are are suffering through injuries with uh, with with their running back room. Like I mentioned, they could take up their own infirmary if this was a, a battalion. But um, they have, like I said, they have backup linebackers in. So one running back that isn't on the injured list and isn't as banged up is uh, a guy named Adrian friggin' Peterson. <laughs> and this is, I know, more of a pipe dream than, a, than an expectation that, and I'm not going to say he's going to go for, you know, 280 yards or whatever he did against the Chargers that one year when I was a San Diego Chargers fan, just watching him run rampant. Um, he's clearly not that guy. He's a shell of himself, but you know, maybe he makes a key first down here or there. Uh, maybe he scores a touchdown. I don't know. I think that this, if the, if, the Seahawks use him early and get a score with Adrian Peterson and take the lead maybe early in the game with an Adrian Peterson score. That could inject some serious juice into this team and in this fan base thinking Adrian Peterson just scored a touchdown for the Seahawks. You know, 10 years ago, eight, nine years ago, that would have been, you know, it's a really fun statement to say, but still it is even as a future Hall of Famer making a stop in Seattle. So just for fun and a little bit of hope, sprinkled with some uh, hoping for some miracles, I'm going to go Adrian Peterson from the running back position. And we don't know. He might be in a in a position where they need him to run the ball eight to ten times this week because of their injury situation. So I don't think that that's a far fetched one. He did score a touchdown in one of his three games that he played for the Titans earlier this year. So I think at least between the tackles, he can still contribute in some capacity. At thirty six, he's not going to be an every down back. He's been past that for several years, but maybe he can still contribute as a reserve that can come in and give you some hard runs up the middle. My pick to click is going to be the tight end spot. I've gone with Gerald Everett a couple times this year, and both times it didn't work out in my favor. So I'm going to switch up the tight end of choice here, and I'm going to go with Will Disley because it feels like it's been a couple of years, really, since we've seen him have a big game as a receiver after that second injury that he had, the Achilles tear. We haven't really seen him consistently be involved in Seattle's passing game, but I look at the linebackers that we've talked about a couple of times they're down to second and third stringers, even fourth stringers at linebacker right now, the 49ers are. So I think this is a game, particularly in the red zone, that Will Disley could really play a big role on offense. In fact, I'm going to go as far as saying that he makes five catches, 45 yards, and I think he gets two touchdowns in this game. I think Russell Wilson's going to throw three of them, but I think two of those are going to go to Will Disley in this game. And so I think that Will Disley is going to have a, a big game. and. He's nearing the end of his rookie contract. We don't know if he's going to be back next year. He's got a lot to play for. Those are the kind of guys when you're going down the stretch, especially in a lost season like this, that you can look to look towards to potentially have big games. So I'm rolling the dice on Will Disley. Now let's flip to the defensive side of the ball. Who's your pick to click on defense where the Seahawks have been playing pretty darn good for over a month? Absolutely. And a guy that's kind of been at, at the forefront of that, it, it, he, go, he went from being – nearly cut last year or before the season. I think we both agree that Rasheem Green was very much on the bubble to make this roster heading into camp. And now he's become one of their better defensive linemen. And he actually leads the team in pressures with 14, according to, to pro football uh, reference. So I'm going to go Rasheem Green having another big day. And the, the 49ers are 19th in pass blocking win rate. So not exactly world beaters as far as protection. And I, I think he gets a sack. I think he gets a sack and a key tackle for loss in the run game to keep the Seahawks in the game late in the game. And I, I'm not sure he's going to you know, run back at, at an extra point this, this week. But uh, um, I, I'm, I'm expecting him to keep up the mojo. I think his confidence is, is an all-time high, and it should be. He's been one of the best. I think he's a top two or three candidate for defensive MVP for the Seahawks, if you're naming those guys. And I think it's going to continue this week. I'm going to go with a household name now. He is leading Pro Bowl voting at free safety. I was going to go with Puna Ford, but I've got to go with Quandre Diggs because, I, you know, referencing baseball history here, Pedro Martinez used to call the Yankees his daddy. Well, I think the three quarterbacks in the NFC West, the three starting quarterbacks, Colt McCoy has been immune to this for whatever reason, but your starters, Jared Goff back in the day, now Matt Stafford, Jimmy Garoppolo, Kyler Murray, they have all been intercepted by Quandre Diggs at least one time in a Seahawks uniform during NFC West rivalry games. So I think that 
we are going to see Quandre Diggs once again have Jimmy Garoppolo's number in this game. I think he gets interception number four, and I think he is going to be all over the field. They're going to have a tough time getting throws down the seam or on the post because Quandre Diggs has just been so darn good this year. He's been so consistent, and I think he's going to continue to be Jimmy Garoppolo's daddy in this matchup. Don't know if it leads to a win, but I think a big game coming for Quandre Diggs back in center field. Yeah, hopefully it's uh, it doesn't turn into a game where the Niners fans are chanting, who's your daddy? Um, <laughs> I, I like that reference there. And also I was looking at the numbers, and, and you bring up a good point. Uh, among guys who have been targeted on, on defense at least 30 times, you know, we got Ugo Amadi with a 98.1 passer rating allowed. You got DJ Reed, they're pretty solid, 82.8 passer rating allowed. Jamal Adams, 94.8 passer rating allowed. With 33 targets against Quandre Diggs, 58.6 passer rating. That is a solid, solid number. So shout out to, to Quandre Diggs. That's an excellent pick. Yeah, he would be the first to tell you if you've been on social media, especially if you're getting that data from Pro Football Focus, he'll be like, where are those targets? Like He, he, he will dispute, I haven't even been targeted that much. And so he has always felt that those numbers are inflated to work against him and that you know some people that's the case you should be an all pro then <laughs> <laughs> i think he has played like an all pro and that's why i said i'm going with the guy that now is a household name you know there's a reason he's number one in pro bowl balloting you talk to other analysts that cover other teams in the nfc west and he is always one of the first players that gets mentioned all of quandary Diggs has been fantastic and he has been he's been the most consistent player on Seattle's roster on either side of the ball this year, in my opinion. So I'm going to go with the old standby there, Quandre Diggs. I think he's got a big game coming against the 49ers. Already picked Garoppolo once this year. I think he gets number two. Going to be a lot of fun to watch this matchup, even if it's lost some of its luster with the Seahawks being five games under 500. And the 49ers are obviously still right in the thick of things in the playoff race. But this is still a game that is going to generate a lot of excitement at Lumen Field. Two bitter rivals going against each other. Looking forward to seeing how things unfold on Sunday afternoon. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen every day. Now make sure to check out the Locked On Bets podcast as your second listen. It's your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. You can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Nick at Nick Lee 51 Make sure to check out Locked On Seahawks on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and the all-new Odyssey app. Coming up on Monday, hopefully we're going to snap this three-straight-week streak of having Misery Monday, and we'll be breaking down a Seahawks victory over the 49ers. As always, enjoy the game. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Go Hawks.